Good morning, Facebook friends and fellow bridge builders. I'm Pastor Jeff Smith, and I have the great privilege of serving here at Remington United Methodist Church. And I know that there are lots of you tuned in uh, this morning to our worship service. Many of you, this is your home church, and, and you're, it's, it's wonderful to have you here, even though you can't be here. And there are lots of you out there, too, that are just joining us today for all kinds of reasons. And you might be wondering what that means, what that fellow bridge builders phrase means. And very simply, uh, let me explain it very quickly. Bridge builders, we see ourselves as bridge builders. And that, by what we mean by that is that at Remington United Methodist Church, we believe we exist for one reason and one reason only, to build bridges between people and Jesus. And we're going to do that however we can, whether it's live in person someday after this virus thing has all gone away, or whether we're doing it digitally like we are right now. We are bridge builders. Now, here's the thing. For our Facebook friends, you don't have to be a member of this church to be a bridge builder. I would encourage you to be a bridge builder too, especially today on this glorious Easter Sunday. And for that reason, we are so glad you're with us. Hey, we're going to talk about a couple of things before we, we dive in to go further into worship. And one of them is kind of a sad, a bittersweet thing. It's, it's sad and glad in a couple of different ways. But here it is. Uh, today, we're going to light our Paschal candle, which is one of the things we do here at Remington when we want to honor somebody, one of our beloved that has passed. And sometime this morning around 1.20, Roger Wheeling lost his fight with, with cancer. But friends, let me tell you, he won the eternal battle, and he is dancing with Jesus this morning. Now, friends, let me ask you a question. That is a sad thing for those of us who are left behind. But what a special thing it is to pass away on Easter Sunday only to be resurrected the same day and be with Jesus. And this is what that Resurrection Sunday means. So now I'm going to invite Cassidy to come and light the Paschal candle for us in memory of Roger. And as she lights that candle, we're going to have a moment of quiet reflection. And then I'm going to pray. All right. So Cassidy. All right, friends, let's enter into a moment of prayer. Good morning, Lord. It's a different kind of Easter Sunday. The sanctuaries all across our nation and perhaps all across the world are empty today. But that doesn't mean that your son has not risen, for he has. For our departed brother, Roger, he has risen indeed, and Roger along with him. And here on earth, we still have some time to play out, and we're in no hurry to meet our eternal destiny, but we are eagerly looking forward to it. But that time that we have to play out, we have to navigate this new world. And no, I'm not talking about coronavirus. I'm talking about those who, who loved Roger Wheeling the most and knew him the best. They have to navigate a new world without him in it. And while most of the people that knew Roger and loved him are, are followers of your son Jesus, they still have to deal with that empty place at the table where Roger once sat in their hearts. I think the vast majority of them know that they know that they will see him again and that Jesus is preparing a place for them too, but that's then and this is now. So Lord, I lift up my prayers for two different things. One is that for the family and friends of Roger Wheeling, that they on this Easter Sunday and well beyond will experience the peace that passes all understanding as they learn to navigate in this new world. And for all those the rest of us, those of you watching on Facebook and for those of you who are part of our extended church family, I ask that you bless us as we go deeper into this worship service, 
and that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts, may they be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And all of God's people said, amen. Thank you, friends. Thank you, Cassidy. Well, all across the country today, as I just said in the prayer, and all across um, maybe the world, um, sanctuaries like this one, and I'm, I'm looking at it, and there are, are three people out in the sanctuary, and then you can see Jeremy there. Um, it's not a typical Easter Sunday for us here at Remington United Methodist Church. The sanctuary is empty except for the folks that I've just identified, and um, it's, it feels weird. I mean, it really does feel kind of strange to look at all these empty seats. Having said that, though, I want you to know, those of you that have commented on Facebook for other messages and some of my other promotional things, that the, 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 it's, it, we sense your presence here. We, it's almost as if you're here, even though you're not. You're watching and you're praying while you watch. It's, it's a powerful thing, and I want to thank you for your prayers. And it's good to have you with us digitally, even though we can't do it in the flesh, so to speak. But having said that, uh, one of the things I'd like to start with this morning is that if these sanctuaries were full, if our sanctuary in particular were full, we would start a worship service like this. And all over the country, a worship leader or a preacher like me, they would start a worship service on Easter Sunday with this expression, He has risen. And then the response from the congregation usually is, he has risen indeed. Now, what that is, that's a, the, the te technological, theological term for that is call, pastor says, response, congregation responds. That's called a call and response. Now, there are all kinds of calls and responses in, in the liturgy and in churches, but this call and response, this he has risen one, it's one of my favorites. And I love it because it is a great way to start Easter for a, a couple of reasons. One, it acknowledges that it is indeed Easter, but it also narrows our focus for worship on the fact that he has risen. So I'm going to invite you to do this with me digitally because we're going to do it anyway. We're not going to let that part of Easter be robbed from us. So are you ready? Here we go. He is risen. And, and I can hear you responding out there. He has risen indeed. Even though I can't physically hear you, I know that you are. And we're not going to let that joy be taken from us. And, and isn't that fun? Wasn't that wonderful just to do that, to get that expression of joy off your chest to just be able to say yes he has risen i love that saying so much and i don't know about you but when i attend a worship service or when i lead one no matter how i'm in worship most of the time when i'm in worship and i leave the worship experience to go into my regular life i am jazzed I am energized. I have so much emotional and spiritual energy that when I leave a church on Sunday morning or when I leave any kind of worship service, I am fortified for the world. How about you? Maybe that's the same for you. You, you leave church and you're all wound up. You're ready. Your church is good and, and you're ready to take on the week and maybe the month and the year and the days after. But so often, in fact, every time, Sunday is followed by Monday, and then Tuesday comes, and then Wednesday. And, and sometimes by the time you hit Wednesday, you've lost that focus a little bit because life happens, amen? And sometimes life runs over you, and sometimes you have rough weeks, and sometimes you can have two or three rough weeks in a row. I've been there, haven't you? And then you lose that focus, and it's harder and harder to get it back. So, you find yourself distant from God. And it, it's like you wake up in one of your bluer moments, and you think, where did God go? <clears throat> he was right here, but he doesn't seem to be here anymore. And I know a lot of you in this COVID-19 world that we live in, you probably feel like that from time to time. Like, where did God go? Well, I want to assure you of two things. First of all, if God is distant from us, it's never because God moved. It's because we moved. 
So once you realize that and you have that context, the next step is simple. You draw closer to God. The other thing that I want to talk about in this moment is it doesn't have to steal our joy, those life happens moments or those moments where we feel like we've been run over by a truck. Those moments where we have to say goodbye to a loved one. Those moments when things seem to go so terribly amiss. Those moments, those stir-crazy moments where if I have to stay in this house for one more second, I'm going to die. Those moments do not have to define us. We don't have to steal our joy. And if God's distance, it's not because God moved. So we can come back to God. And that's what a worship service like this is all about. It's to help us draw closer to God. The He is risen. He is risen to deed. It's a major focus point where we can draw our attention closer to the thing that matters most, and that is that the tomb is empty. Now, our text this morning is about two fellows on the road that were, they were on a road to a place called Emmaus, and they were lost. They had had these wonderful worship experiences, and they had done all kinds of things about, with, with Jesus. They were two of his disciples, and they had followed him around, and they'd seen amazing things, but after the crucifixion, they were going home, presumably. We don't really know what they were doing, but they were on the road, and their hearts were heavy. And their joy was gone, and they felt distant from God. Hear about this for yourself as Cassidy reads the word for us. On that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all of the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it was as the woman had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe that all of these prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is near evening. And the day is almost over, so he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. And then their eyes were open, and they recognized him. He disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were our hearts not burning within us while while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Thank you, Cassidy. (laughs) This has been the word of God for the people of God. Call and response. Thanks be to God. That story is from Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 32. And I would like to strongly encourage you to read it when you have a second. It's a, it's a wonderful story about, as you've just heard Cassie read, about these two fellows that had, they had been Jesus followers. They were huge Jesus fans. And they were on this road. And they were so downcast. And, and who can blame them? Now, there are two things that that stand out about them in this story. The the first one is the anonymity of them. Uh, One of the two, we don't even know his name. We're not told. And the other, his name is mentioned, Cleopas. But in all of New Testament, he's a pretty, pretty obscure character. In fact, to the best of my research, I don't know that his name ever surfaces again in all of the New Testament. So we, we don't know much about either of them. We know that they were Jesus followers, though, and let's start with that. 
The second thing that stands out is the more obvious one, and that is they didn't recognize Jesus. Isn't that kind of strange? These Jesus followers, they didn't recognize Jesus, but they did not. Now, one of the verses implies strongly that they were kept from recognizing him. Now, some students of the Bible would say that that's this divine intervention that kept them from recognizing Jesus. And I certainly wouldn't doubt that judgment. I would not dispute it because uh, God can do whatever he wants to do. And if that's what God wanted to do, so be it, right? God is sovereign. But I think there's a far simpler explanation than that, right? And I'd like to explore that theory with you for the rest of this, this time together that we have. And I think that they were walking along on the road to Emmaus, and they were pondering all the events that they'd just seen. And they, this was sometime post-crucifixion, right? So presumably the previous Friday, more or less, They'd watch their teacher, their friend, their rabbi be crucified on a Roman cross, put in a tomb, sealed, dead, buried, right? At, at this point in time, I'm, I'm thinking of a line from The Princess Bride where Billy Crystal's character goes, well, there's dead, and there's mostly dead, and you don't come back from dead. You might remember that line too, but for, for these two people in that very first that very first post-Holy Week, uh, they're, they're thinking this context that Jesus is dead. I mean, dead, dead. And these people in first century Palestine, if you were with us for our Good Friday service the other night, you know that they were intimately familiar with the concept of death. <clears throat> they'd seen it. They'd experienced it. They'd watched as young mothers died in childbirth. They'd watched as children died of waterborne diseases and other illnesses. They'd watched people expire from all kinds of accidents in all kinds of ways. And, and they, this was not their first crucifixion. Crucifixion was all too common. And historically, it would be all too common in the future. In fact, these two brothers, these two followers of Jesus, this is probably not the last crucifixion that they would ever witness. And I would, I would suspect that in the future they would witness the crucifixions of far too many of their brothers and sisters in the faith. But in that moment, when they were walking along the road to Emmaus, Jesus was dead, and so was their dream. And so was the dream that everything Jesus had taught them would be true. And you can kind of relate to that, can't you? I know that we've had 2,000 years of tradition and experience about, about this whole Easter resurrection moment, but it hadn't happened for them yet. Oh, the resurrection had happened, obviously. They met Jesus on the road to Emmaus. But for them, they didn't know that. It seems strange, doesn't it, that they wouldn't know that? But having said all of that, I don't want to be too hard on these two guys. And I don't want to be too hard on them because of my own personal experiences, and maybe for you too. Have you ever had that experience where somebody comes up and starts talking to you, and you know that you know them, and it's really obvious that you know, they know you, and as that conversation is going, your mind is racing and your heart is beating fast, and you're thinking, oh, please, God, let me know where I know them from. Help me remember who they are. Have you been there? Have you been there? Yeah. I have been too. <laughs> and one of two things is probably going to happen. You're either going to have to confess to the embarrassing question, help me remember who you are. Or at some point in time, it's going to spark for you and you're going to remember. That name will come and that, that face will be matched with a name and, and you'll remember who that person is. Have you been there? <laughs> I've been there far too many times that I want to tell you about. But what usually happens when I don't have to succumb to the embarrassing question, help me know where I know you from, is that something pops into my mind that puts the person into context, right? And maybe that's true for you. See, the human mind is interesting in how it works. The human brain is this marvelous, marvelous instrument that, that compartmentalizes and puts things in categories. It's a natural orderer of things. And when you have the context for the person in front of you, and you know then where you know them from, it's far easier to recall that name. Has that happened to you? Of course it has, right? But I'd like to share one time that it, it happened to me um, in, in a way to kind of anchor this point. 
I was in an airport once, many, many, many years ago, and I was standing next to this very large man at the luggage carousel. And I, as I would look at him, and we were kind of chatting, as you do in times like this, and I thought, I know that guy from somewhere. And I couldn't place it, and I couldn't place it, and I couldn't place it. And then it occurred to me that I'm in the Pittsburgh airport, and I looked at this fellow one more time, and then, boom, I had it. I knew exactly who it was. I had been standing next to Willie Stargell. Now, for those of you that have been around for a while, you might remember that Willie Stargell played 31 seasons for the Pittsburgh Pirates as their first baseman and left fielder. But at the time that I met him, face-to-face, -face, so to speak, I had seen him play on television many, many, many times. I'd never seen him play in person. I never got to see a Pirates game while he was, was still playing. But obviously, at that luggage carousel, three or four years after Willie retired, we were standing there, and he wasn't wearing a baseball uniform. So he was wildly out of context for me. And the minute I connected him to, the, to Pittsburgh and the Pittsburgh Pirates, I knew who he was. Have you ever had that happen too? I mean, not so much with a celebrity, but you make that connection and then you know who that person is, right? So going back to those two fellas as they were walking along the road, dejected, joyless, sad, context mattered. Right? And this stranger comes along and starts to walk with them and says, hey, what are you guys talking about? And so they tell him. And I can almost visualize this unknown stranger chuckling and saying, hey, don't, don't you know the story? You need to know the backstory of all this. And here it is. And, and Jesus, the unrecognized Jesus, lays it all out. Now, as that story is unfolding, I'm sure there's context clue after context clue. And, and maybe, I don't know this for sure, but I'd like to think that, that as Jesus was unfolding the scriptures for them, that, that they began to think, man, this guy is familiar. This guy, he, he, it seems like I know him, but I can't quite place him. Doesn't that kind of make sense? That for the two of them, they would be having those kinds of thoughts where, okay, I know this guy from somewhere. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? But remember, the person that they were being reminded of was dead. Not mostly dead, but dead. So for them, the possibility that they might be talking to a risen Jesus at this point in history was the remotest of possibilities. So Jesus, walking along with them in the on the road to Emmaus, was wildly out of context. Can you picture that? So they do what is considered polite, what is a cultural expectation of their time, as they're walking along and they get towards Emmaus and they invite the stranger to stay with them for the night and to offer him a meal, and they, they convince him to do just that, and he does. And he comes in, they're sitting together, and the stranger takes the bread and prays over it and breaks it and begins to give it to them. And it's like, of course, this is Jesus. And they had their Willie Stargell moment like I did. Where like, of course, this makes so much sense because they had their biggest context clue that you could possibly imagine. Friends, Easter is more than just a special Sunday service. It is one massive context clue. Now, I want to talk a, a moment or two about this, this church word. <clears throat> And for those of you that are seasoned saints, you're going to know this word. And, but for those of you that are maybe kicking the tires of faith and you're just kind of checking this out, it's going to sound like one of those intimidating church, churchy words, but don't, don't let it intimidate you. The word is sacrament. Sacrament. Now, that's a, a word, a term we, we apply to very special things we do in the church. In our United Methodist denomination, for example, the, the act of baptism and, and the act of communion are both sacraments, right? Very special things in the season and life of our church, right? And the word sacrament very simply means sacred moments. Now, other denominations, other churches, they have many other sacraments, too. For example, our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters have seven elements of church life that they consider sacramental, right? One uh, Protestant denomination, one of their sacraments is, is foot washing, and I only mention that because I think that's kind of cool, right? 
So a sacramental moment is a, a very special moment in the life of the church. But I want to suggest to you this, that while some moments are sacramental, all worship moments are sacred. Let me say that one more time. While there are some specific acts in the church that are sacramental in nature, all worship moments in the church are sacred. They are sacred moments. We have entered into worship today, and the space is sacred, and these moments, each one of them as they tick by, are sacred. In, In a sense, sacramental, right? These are sacred moments. So there are people out there, I'm sure, and, and a lot, maybe some of your friends that would say, so, hey, I get it that it's Easter, and it's great that the Easter Bunny could come for our kids as they came for our two grandsons this morning, and it's wonderful that we can have all that Easter hoopla, but really, what, what's the big deal anyway? I mean, I, I know all about the Jesus story and all that, but really, what's the big deal, right? Well, for one thing, it's a big deal because it is a a sacred moment. But all of these sacred moments, communion, baptism, Easter, Sunday worship, fellowship with the saints, all of those sacred moments, they are like road signs on our spiritual highway that keep us informed about the direction we're going in and whether or not it's the right one. Earlier in this message, we talked about these two guys on the road to Emmaus and how they must have felt lost. They they lived in this unimaginable world now where all their road signs were gone. They had no more mile markers to to identify themselves with in terms of who they were spiritually and maybe indeed even who they were as people. Those were all gone. And all of us have been in places like that, haven't we? Have you ever been in in an unimaginable landscape that None of, them, none of the road signs are familiar and all the mile markers are gone. Maybe it's because a, a spouse told you that it was over. Or, or maybe it's because an employer said, hey, nothing personal, we, we love you, but we're eliminating your position and your job is gone. Or maybe it's the diagnosis of a loved one isn't as hopeful as you would have liked. Or perhaps you're sitting at home for the fourth week wondering if, when and if, this whole coronavirus thing will ever end, and then will you have a job to go back to once it does? In moments like that, those are mile markers, our road signs, our, our, the, the things that point us in the right direction. They're all, they're all gone or they're in a different context and you can't see them or you can't recognize them. Can, can you understand that? I'm sure you can, right? Easter. Communion, baptism, church worship, digitally or together, sacred moments. The sacred moments that come into our lives, they're like, they're like the road signs that help us understand where we are and where we're going, right? And we live for those road signs. Those road signs are are like those moments when this invisible God draws near and in that that nearness of that sacred moment, he becomes almost touchable, tasteable, and seeable. We can almost see him, touch him, feeling him, taste him. Those sacred moments where the, the thin places in the earth draw even thinner and we almost can physically sense the presence of God and the risen Jesus. Sacred moments or roadside moments. Now, to anchor this point, I'd like to share a personal story with you, if I could. (laughs) Several years ago, my brother Jerry lived in Roanoke, Virginia, and on one Thursday afternoon, I went to Muncie and picked up my mom, and and we went down to Roanoke to visit him for a long Easter weekend, and we had a blast. It was it wasn't an easy week. It was just simply a long weekend, excuse me. But we were down there for this long weekend, and, and we had a blast. We, we, we drove around, looked at Blue Ridge Mountains and different things that my brother was involved in, and we, we just had a wonderful, wonderful time. It was a, an absolute blessing. But then Monday came, and it was time for us to head home and to Muncie. And so we met at a local Cracker Barrel, and we had a scrumptious breakfast. We said our goodbyes to my brother. He went off to work, and my mom and I headed back. To Muncie, Indiana. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm a flatlander from Indiana, 
And I love the mountains. They're so beautiful and majestic. But if you've ever driven in the Blue Ridge Mountains and your background is one like mine, it's kind of easy to get disoriented in the mountains. And as we got onto the entrance ramp of, of I-64, I, I was pretty sure this is the way we, need, we were going. And so we're on I-64, heading right along, chatting about this and that and what a wonderful time we'd had this weekend. And, and pretty soon I see a road sign that said, Richmond. 168, 168 miles. Now, I, I don't expect you to know anything about the geography of the Commonwealth of Virginia, but just take my word for it that if you find yourself traveling towards Richmond, Virginia, and you want to go to Muncie, Indiana, it's going to take a long time for you to get there because you're going the wrong way. <laughs> and I remember looking over at my mom and saying, hey, mom, we're going the wrong way. Now, the thing about that moment for me was that, see, my wife already thinks I'm incredibly directionally challenged, and she, of course, is wrong. Of course, she's also not here to, to say otherwise. <laughs> so I looked at my mom and said, not a word of this to anybody. <laughs> so we got off the highway, we turned around, we headed back west the way we should have been going all the time. Now, I know that's a, a silly anecdotal moment, But in all seriousness, when life tells you that you're a loser, when you're tempted to hear that voice that said, my daddy was a drunkard, my grandpappy was a drunkard, I guess I'm a drunkard. When you hear that voice that says, you are a gossiper and you'll never change. When you hear that voice that says, you're worthless, those are the wrong road signs. And there is a risen Savior that wants to whisper in your ear and says, no, you're good. Turn around. Head the other way. And if you listen to my voice, I'll show you how to go. And here we are on this Easter Sunday in this sacred moment, this sacred space, this road sign, if you will, where we hear the voices that say he has risen. And we hear those responsive voices that say he has risen indeed. And we know we're on the right track. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his countenance towards you and give you peace. He wants to, you know. He does. And because he's risen, you can hang on to that. Blessings.